I'm not really using slides today. And I'm gonna do that for a couple of reasons. One is I didn't expect quite so many people. So I was hoping to have a conversation and we're still going to have a conversation, I promise. Um, but also because I wanna make sure that we're actually engaged and in interaction. And it is such an incredible honor to be here with you all. Um, we're in door to lead and uh, back many, many moons ago when I didn't have gray and my left shoulder wasn't so achy, I was a chief resident here and we would do all of our conferences in this room in the early aughts. And so this room is like very, very familiar and looks exactly the same. They haven't changed the carpets or the chairs in that time frame. They used to have a projector in that open gap in seats, which is why that gap exists. And um, it's also a reminder that I am both a part of this place because I remain here standing in front of this podium. And this place is very much a part of me, which animates a lot of the conversations that I've had since and continue to have today. Um, but most of this conversation will be about the years between standing here as a chief resident and standing here today. The things that I've learned both through my patients who are always my best teachers, um, through a breadth of experiences that have led me far from academia through government and industry and the entrepreneurial world, but also through the pandemic where we all had our lives changed and none more so than those of us who stood on the front lines of a virus and a society that was telling us that things weren't as they were. Um, how many people in this room are caregivers, nurses, doctors, physicians, pharmacists, et cetera? Okay. And how many of those who are caregivers are in training still? Okay, great. That's helpful. One thing about being a caregiver is we are part of every society. Um, we are and every culture across time. And in fact, if you don't believe it, tell somebody that you have an ache and you will hear quite a lot of answers, even from those who are not particularly trained about what it is that is required to get you better. Um, what's interesting about a caregiver is we see the outcomes of societal decisions expressed in the bodies and stories of our patients. And if we listen closely, we understand a lot about the way society works, depending on the society that we're in. I want to talk a little bit about what do we see and hear about society when we listen closely to these bodies? What are the systems at play? And what do we as individuals and collectively as groups of individuals, what are we required to do when we confront these systems? And where do we start? I know that we started a little late and given that my goal was to have some dialogue, I'm not gonna talk the whole time. I'm gonna try to push through a bunch of things that I suspect many of you already know. It, they ought to resonate even if you didn't actually know them, I suspect they'll be familiar. And then get to a part where I hope that we are all a little bit out of our depth and start to discuss what are the things that we can do now and into the future. Let me start with a couple of stories. Um, I am an attending in our emergency department where I've been an attending since a long, long time, not 20 years, but I'm getting closer and closer to that number every day. Um, a couple of years ago, I took care of a woman who for various reasons was unable to take the medication that she'd been prescribed for schizophrenia. Her voices were getting louder. She was unable to manage her activities of daily living. She was worried that the voices would start to tell her to do things like they've done before. And so before it got that bad, she came to the emergency department. I arrived at 6.30 in the morning. Our shifts go from 6.30 to 10, 6.30 to 2.30, 2.30 to 10.30, 10.30 until the morning. And we have a couple of other shifts interspersed in between to make sure that we have overlap and enough coverage. 6.30 in the morning, everybody's pretty bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, at least the staff is. The waiting room is at its nadir for the day. We're going to have as few people as possible. We use that time often for teaching because that's when we're not running around panicked. 
me and the resident go and visit this new patient. And what we learn is that she'd been in the waiting room since 10 o'clock the night before. That's actually not quite uncommon. We're very busy. Um, we often see 180 people in a day. Sometimes there are another 30 or 40 people who leave before they're able to be seen. And she was disheveled. She hadn't eaten. She'd been sitting there, whatever she'd gotten, she'd gotten out of a vending machine. And she was responding to me, but it was also clear she was responding to something else. Right? She had external stimulus. It's pretty easy. We know what, what to do. We screen her for any metabolic causes that may have triggered this lapse. We contact our psychiatry colleagues who come down and evaluate her. They determined that she needed an admission in order to get her back under control on the right medications, which may need to be tweaked. And the resident and I go back to our shift. We see another, you know, I might've seen 50 people that day. We're busy, we're running around. I go home, minding my own business. The next day I come back for the next shift, 6.30 in the morning again. The woman is still in the same room. She never got admitted. She also didn't shower. The treatment plans that we'd written for were sporadically given because shift after shift, everybody thinks, well, it'll be the next team that'll handle it. She'll be out of here at any point in time. She wasn't out of here. The voices are louder. She's frustrated. And what I realized in that time was she's trapped, right? This isn't really a villain or an evil person that was doing this. This is a system that conspired to trap this patient in the emergency department. And many of the caregivers, instead of looking hard at the challenge, looked away. Like it's much easier to say, well, here's some things I can solve as opposed to here's something that I don't know that I can solve or not. And so we're trapped right alongside her. Okay, here's another story. This is last year. On Thursdays, there are no residents. They have conference in places like this and are spoken to by people like me and the attendings cover the emergency department without them. I had a patient come in at about 10 o'clock in the morning who was unable to eat. He, had, he was in his early 30s. He had kind of the wiry, bulgy veins that make a nurse's life really easy. And he claimed that four nights before he was at a party, drinking, having a good time, he got accosted and was in a fight with a couple of people. And he was winning, according to him, until somebody hit him from behind and knocked him out. He woke up on the ground and got hurt. He was drunk. He went home, thought it'd be okay. The next day it was not okay, he could not eat. He waited another day because he didn't have insurance because he didn't know exactly where to go. He still could not eat and he came to me spitting blood. That's pretty easy. Fourth year medical student can diagnose that, right? He's got a fractured mandible. He's spitting blood so it's open, right? That's something that we do surgery on. So I did the things. Maximum facial CT, gave him some antibiotics, analgesia, call the max face team. I've got a broken jaw here, come and wire it. And on the other end was a surgical trainee who knew I was an attending because I'm old school. I've been here a long time. People kind of know my name in when they get consulted. And um, he had seen the CT and sort of was sheepish. He was like, yeah, Dr. Fisher, um, I've seen the CT, uh, but he doesn't have insurance. So we can't do his surgery here. Um, give him some antibiotics, an antibiotic swish, and send him to Cook County Hospital for his surgery. Here's a guy who can't eat, hasn't eaten for three days, has an open fracture. This patient's trapped, right? That resident is here to do surgeries like this, right? That's what the training is, right? The operating rooms are waiting for surgeries like this. Everybody is here for the same mission, but systems have conspired to trap the patient and to trap us right alongside the patient in this Gordian knot. For those who are not trainees, I suspect you will have seen situations like this before where 
you've seen society and healthcare conspire together to trap our patients and to trap us along with them, where people come to us in an emergency or after a series of bad days looking for help. And then we can't give them what they need for arbitrary reasons, whether it's because we're too busy or because they don't have the right insurance. They have a human need, we have the human resources and there's a barrier that stops us from doing that. And collectively that means that we've been training for decades to do these things and we cannot. It's the reason why we came to work that day. It's the reason why we're in training. And I give those examples about our emergency department, but we are not unique. This is not something that the University of Chicago does. This is something that happens in emergency departments across the nation, urban and rural. We just happen to be able to see them here because we're also in America. Because in EDs across the nation, we are mandated to serve everybody by the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, regardless of their ability to pay. And yet, despite that, too often we delay, deny, defer, reject, and even bankrupt people who seek care. But what's interesting is in these same places, we also sometimes are able to give the best care in the world. The kind of care that people fly across seas in order to receive. The fact that these two things happen simultaneously is not an accident. It's not a bug, it's a feature of the sort of systems that we've set up. And so what are those systems and what are your responsibilities? America has ordered the resources required to stay healthy through centuries of policies, both formal and informal, and our healthcare systems are similarly ordered. So we have systems within the communities that are at play and system within our walls that are also in play and they interact. And just for a moment, indulge me to tell you a bunch of things that I suspect you all already know um, because Times have changed. It used to be people didn't know these things, and now I suspect everybody knows, but we're gonna go them go through them quickly just so that we have a common language. Um, you all know Chicago is one of the most segregated cities in the country. And you all know that that didn't happen by accident where people just weren't like, ah, oh, you know what, I'd rather live over here and they'd live or, rather live over there. It wasn't just a random chance. These were policies, right? So between 1916 and 1970, 1916 and 1970, a half million African-American folks came from the South fleeing terrorism along the train migration. Many of them settled here on the South side, others settled on the West side. In 1970, there was a federal ruling that required scattered site public housing, but by then there were already a million people living in concentrated segregation on the South side. Mostly in high rises that no longer exist that were alongside the Dan Ryan, but in other places as well. You all also know that restrictive covenants and redlining were policies that ensured that race defined where people could and could not live in our city. And when people slipped through those loopholes, you all also know that violence reinforced these social covenants that were eluded by those who got through the legal covenants. And that created boundaries, right? When I was a kid in the 80s and 90s, I grew up here in Hyde Park. The war on drugs was launched. You all probably know that, even though you may not have been alive yet. And the war on drugs was shackling, even though drug use at the time was similarly was similar across races. It was focused in Black communities. And it was shackling Black men, taking them out of their communities and out of the workforce, adding to poverty. Along the same time, policies like NAFTA took construction jobs, industrial jobs, labor out of the city and either took them out of the country or moved them to the suburbs. Meaning that those who did live here had a much more difficult time finding jobs that they could actually access in a meaningful way, right? It's already hard to get downtown for a job, but what if you have to go to Schaumburg, right? Two buses and a train is like not even in the realm. And what that did was it created concentrated race and concentrated poverty. This wasn't because like, oh, this one person was evil. If only we had stopped that one person, we'd be okay. We created decades of systems through policies, both formal and informal. 
And what that does is it means that even if you're middle class on the South side, like many people are, or even higher upper middle class, you are more likely to have poor schools, poor neighborhood neighbors, fewer healthcare options than those in wealthier, whiter communities on the North side. Look, segregation is regretful. Like it's not just because we don't fully understand and relate to our neighbors. It also has these um, implications for how it pins people in place and leaves them open for exploitation, right? In the 08s, there was a housing bubble that had a lot of inputs that we would all say weren't right. But one of them was it created a lot of predatory mortgages um, Wells Fargo was hauled in front of Congress multiple times because they had internal documents that described mud people loans that were for people who you would imagine are on the south side and on the south side of cities across the country that were higher interest, higher risk, and blew up all at once. And what that did was it not only robbed communities of wealth, it also um, robbed them of their homes. And it left neighborhoods cluttered with abandoned buildings. And it also, that led to shaping food deserts and job deserts. And then schools were closed for low attendance, schools that were sort of anchors where people could both get food and also were places of convening and after school basketball and things of that nature. And then it led to the further direction of investments and jobs out of the community and further north. So you have this cycle. And so on net, what you'll find is Chicago's South Side has still pays tax dollars, but then becomes disconnected from these shared services, things like schools and businesses. And without these centers of gravity that cohere communities, um, you see the same cycles of violence that you see across the nation. And in this way, you link poverty, race, and violence. For those who are interested, both in the room and online, there's a really interesting book called A Peculiar Indifference that I think came out in probably 2020, 2022, that by Elliot Curie that documents about 100 years of data defining where you will find interpersonal violence and where you won't. And the common thread is always deep deprivation and concentrated poverty, like what leads our trauma center to be the busiest in the state systems. The other thing this recognizes is once you take this common tax dollar and disconnect services, where do those services and resources go? They end up going to the north side, right, where you have much denser communities, where you have um, flower boxes and streets, you have different sorts of policing, not more, not less, but very different kinds of policing. And Chicago is somewhat unique in that way. The segregation that's linked so densely to race here looks very different than some of the downtrodden communities in New York and LA, in that the communities that are struggling today are struggling the same or worse than they were 30 years ago, as compared to Bushwick, Brooklyn, the East Village, neighborhoods that are very desirable today, but in the 90s, nobody would be caught dead in them. Right? Those communities weren't segregated by race in the same way, and people saw opportunity and growth, and that's exactly what they did. Our communities shape our bodies, right? They define our social networks, our wealth, our education. And when you have a city like ours that has, well before all of our time, defined who has access to those resources and therefore our personal health and outcomes, you recognize that Chicago forces Black folks to run a gauntlet of health risks, dangerous jobs that maim you, food deserts that leave you ill, poisonous water through lead pipes, ubiquitous guns that perforate your body and leave you bleeding. And so in this way, systems have created our health and illness in ways that are neither accidental but also predictable you will see this toll more clearly than anyone. 
these things are, you know, I say you already know these things because they've been rolled up into statistics and are regularly reported. When I was first standing in these stages, we called them health disparities. Now our language has changed into inequities and injustice. The data is very old and where you look, when you look, you'll find it. Black folks make up 31% of Chicago's population, but 80% of those people shot. That's almost... 800 people in 2021 when we were seeing these spasms of violence. In Chicago, you'll find the highest blood lead levels in Black kids in our segregated communities. Black women here in Woodlawn deliver low birth weight babies 3.5% of the time compared to 1% in Lincoln Park. Men who live in Inglewood, not far from here, have a life expectancy of 59 years compared to 90 in the Gold Coast. 59 years is about Iraq. It's a developing nation age, and it's right here. Like, we're in a very wealthy community, but we're talking blocks away. If you're born, your life expectancy is less than 60. You did not take advantage of Medicare or Social Security. And so the folks who live on the North side are more likely to be white and wealthy and live longer disease-free lives, while the folks on the South side are more likely to be who are more black are more likely to live shorter lives full of disability. And the fact that these two things exist simultaneously is not two quirks of nature. One exists because of the other, they are connected, right? And I think that for the longest, we describe them as how regretful these two separate situations are, but I think it's more important to recognize that they are one situation that is connected. And so as we change one, we would necessarily need to influence the other in order to share our common tax base and the resources required for us all to stay healthy. It's the silent transfer of quality and years of lives from one side to the other. Social determinants is what we call this. Common lexicon. It's was relatively new 20 years ago, but everybody knows it, but let's make it concrete in the city that we live in and in the patients that you'll see and the care that we de delivered. And we now mostly accept that it's our lives, our world are shaped that affect ourselves and our patients and that these patterns then follow us into healthcare. So for example, we all get sick, period. We only get out of this one way, right? We're all gonna get sick, we're all gonna die. Um, but few besides the most wealthy can actually afford the care that they need. We all have health. We all have and need health insurance. Even in the best conditions, and I mean like when we have low unemployment like now, the best, it is the best jobs that provide health insurance, right? And those people tend to be healthy, already wealthy and educated. And in our society, that means disproportionately white. Right? Our poor people tend to be on Medicare, or I'm sorry, on Medicaid, you aid the poor. They're often in gig jobs where they need two or three jobs in order to have a living wage. Those jobs rarely offer insurance. They work many more hours than those of us who have a normal job because they have to in order to cobble together the right sorts of uh, income in order to pay rent. And that also means they have less time to prepare food that might be healthy. Fast food becomes a crutch. It means they're less likely to have the opportunity to exercise and go for walks and invest in their mental health. And so in Chicago, black folks are less likely to have private insurance than white folks and are 50% more likely than white folks to be completely uninsured, 50% more likely. And so if you look at a map of Chicago, you'll see how it crowds black folks and white folks into disparate communities. And you'll know that places like Inglewood have are 12.3% uninsured compared to only 2.5% in Lincoln Park. And when you have concentrated numbers of patients who cannot pay you, providers respond with fewer services that are more difficult to access. And that's because they still have to pay their electric bills. Medications are not free. Nurses require a salary. And if people come to them who cannot pay them, they will quickly go out of business unless they respond in ways that stint and reduce access, which means mental health resources like are required for patients who need admission are very hard to come by. So what we've done is we've created systems within our society, not villains, 
not hero, systems within our society that most both define who is more likely to get ill, who is more likely to get better, and also what doctors like us who are caring for poor people have at our fingertips in order to solve their medical problems. It shapes our practice as well. Okay done sermonizing about things you already know, but that then leaves us to what do we do? All right, in the first case, the patient with schizophrenia. She was angry and confused. The first time that I spoke to her, she was already responding to external stimuli. Now she had a very hard time making any eye contact or engaging with me at all. We couldn't really communicate now. She had now been two days without showering. Remember, she came in 10 o'clock the night before. Now, two, a day and a half later, I'm revisiting her in that same room. Okay, I re-engage psychiatry. They advised me to redose her medications. That I can do. I ordered her food, a tray, to come down. She hadn't eaten. That will make even sane people respond to external stimuli. Um, and we waited right? For one of two things to happen. Facilities for psychiatry, for psychiatric care are all external, and their waits are commonly 48 hours. At 72 hours, we have an internal process by which those people can get admitted to general medicine, and we can continue their care here. But her course was just beginning, and so we waited. But like everybody else, I kind of wanted to look away. I didn't want to go back in that room, right? Because my hands were tied. What could I really do to make her, to minimize her suffering? She's trapped, I'm trapped. Isn't it just easier to go tackle the things I can tackle? I did something that day, but I didn't do much. I did something. Is that enough? I'm gonna actually want your response in a little bit, but not yet. Here's what I did in the second case. I went back in the room after I was told he needed surgery somewhere else, right? Just like in the first case, I finally went back. I went back in the room and I told him what was going on. I told him he didn't have insurance. I told him that meant that I heard you couldn't get surgery. But then I told him, sit tight, you're gonna be with us for a while. And he asked me a question, right? He said, hey doc, will I be okay? That's kind of a dizzying request. It's something I actually hear a lot, usually with people in extremists, but I hear it all the time. Doc, am I going to be okay? And I never know exactly what they're asking. Are they afraid? Are they worried about their outcome? Are they disoriented? Each time it's somewhat different. And I think that when certainty and comfort are torn away in these moments, people are actually looking for relief and also a guide. They're looking for a guide. And so, you know, I can never promise an end to suffering. We're all going to suffer. He will suffer. Even if he had surgery today, he will probably suffer more. Suffering is not something I can promise an end to. Um, and I can't promise outcomes, right? And usually when I hear these words, I can't even promise that they're going to be what they were before because people come to me quite often at a crossroads in their lives before and after moments. And after may be fine, but it will never be what it was once before. And so I tried to respond with commitment, right? To be that guide and also to merit the trust that I'm now going to expect from him and recognize that he's not alone in this. And that is a conversation that requires sitting down eye contact and a lot of words and time. And that day I had the time. So I did that. And then I spent the next five hours on the phone with my surgical colleagues trying to figure out how to get this guy the surgery that he needs. Because at the end of the day, surgeons want to do surgery. Right? That's why they're here. And we did get this guy surgery that day. He didn't have to go home with a fractured mandible, but he did wait five hours. And that left me with another challenge. What if I was tired? What if it was at the end of my shift and I couldn't be there for five hours? What if he was drunk and somehow distasteful and I didn't feel he was worthy of my effort that day? 
What if I was just too busy? Like, that's not a system. We created a workaround on that day in order to solve a problem for a guy who hadn't eaten in days. The system had us all trapped. And those of us together, we found a place to get out of that trap, right? But these are the kind of situations that lead to burnout, right? In our ED and in EDs across the nation, literally nothing that's happened. I've given talks like this at a lot of EDs around the nation and all the docs are like, yup, same, same, same. We're required to serve everybody, but we just simply can't. And so too often when we're unable to honor our patients in the way that we've been trained, we craft stories to justify that which is unjustifiable that you would never allow to happen to your partner, child, parent. And we then also are often held account to these same systems that hold these resources just out of our reach. Long hours, witnessing unmitigated suffering, being the agent of some of that suffering leads to moral injury, burnout, and people exiting early. There was waves of suicides and exits in the emergency medicine community post pandemic because of this. We got a lot of pizzas, pats on their back, called heroes, but we remained in the trap right next to our patients. And that's why people quit. I think it's important to recognize what we're seeing and also try to understand the primacy of our humanity in these systems when other things like efficiency profit, time are often pushed in front of us when in fact we're in a healing profession and it's that that ought to be our guide. So question one, in the first case, did I do enough? I'm gonna leave that pregnant while I sip. Mm -hmm. Is it enough to get some food, give a shot, and then hide my eyes? Great question. What is the proper perspective? Hmm. I mean, so I work with the military, the military and it seems you're talking a lot about the nausea, not just the symptoms of the concern of austerity. And one thing I've talked to them is like how with the mindset they go forward onto the battlefield is exactly what you're describing. You're not going to have this nausea to get set with the time and calories and that kind of thing. And so some of it, I think, starts with exactly doing the small pieces and having the mindset of grieving. And the opportunity mm. for small things of that nature, keeping your sort of heart soft, maybe mm -hmm. the reality is. But also, one thing I professionally worry about with clinicians is the moral unfair that keeps the bond of the mm -hmm. It reiterates back to So, um, so I'm sorry, but can I pick up on one of the themes that what was your name? that Ann brought up was about, you'll never have enough. I mean, I think that there's this imperative to have moral purity in a fallen society. Like there's no moral purity here. You are not going to be right, not in this life, right? So what's right enough in these moments? I think that we all, all sort of want to find a cocoon where you're like, well, I didn't do it, I'm not, I mean, we are all part of this. You are an American, you work at this institution, you vote, you are as much a part of this as the people you would pin as a villain. You, you don't get to be pure. So once you're in that gray, then what? More. What's that? You can, you can do more. Yes. So you can make sure she has a shower. Um, <laughs> we don't know who, so we, so there's a large amount of funding, uncertain knowledge, limited for science, whatever that's on the 
Would be. Yeah. Just two things I want to amplify. One is widening the aperture. There are other resources. It doesn't have to be just us. I think one of the ways in which I deal with that is by looking at it and not looking away through talks like this, right? I'm not pretending that didn't happen. This happened and it continues to happen. And while we may not know exactly why schizophrenia happens, we do know who's more likely to be out of control such they need an emergency department visit. And starting to talk and think about what are those systems that help some stay controlled, able to maintain their resources and uh, access to care and others not, may be a part of the solution, may not be. I mean, we've had waves of closures of psychiatric hospitals for a lot of different reasons. People who are less likely who are regularly out of control have a hard time maintaining employment and therefore have a hard time keeping the sorts of insurance that keep hospitals open right so it becomes a downward spot all right what did i do enough in the second situation did i do enough i was on the phone for five hours i'm done right So I didn't do anything to change the system that day. In fact, I might have done something to aid the system. By crafting a workaround, I allowed the system to be like, hey, everything works. We'll just leave it as is. Works fine. Was I even honest with the system about it? I mean, I sort of was like, yeah, let me take this on. I saw another hand over here. So it's the, the same point, you know, we can tell our chief equity officer that maybe we should spend our community benefits on doing surgery for urgent procedure, which is over, rather than a more fits because the other one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is one of the big challenges that I think is worth talking about and the reason I sent the King letter. Like, there's a component of this where it's easy to find hope when we have these moments where we touch people 
we hear their stories and we're a part of their lives on days that are before and after moments. And in those moments, we get to be these trusted guides that is can be deeply humanly satisfying, but it also in some ways is revelatory of transcendence. If one believes in those things, you can see these moments where you can see yourself in people very dissimilar, where you recognize that there's this thing that is within all of us, that deepest core thing where when people are stripped bare of their social uh, context, they are deeply human in ways that are unusual to see outside of contexts like caregiving. And what that also forces is that you take this to the moral conclusion that we all owe each other something, right? Something beyond, well, you can't pay for it, so hit the road, or you're just going to be here there. But how to animate our care decisions with that deep fundamental truth that is a guide for a lot of people's morality becomes amorphous and difficult, particularly when you're busy and tired and have bills to pay and wanna go home. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what helps me to think through this and might help you, might help you. Okay, I sent around the King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Who's seen this letter before? Who has read the entirety of it before? Okay. When I was in high school, we got we got pieces of it. It's long. It's like 13 pages. And when you read it, you will see so many fa familiar components. There's so many familiar components because I think this is one of the most important documents of American of America. It is as important as the Constitution and the and the Declaration of Independence. This is who we this is part of what sh has shaped our society. In 1963, King goes down to Birmingham. Birmingham is staging a strike because they've been standing up against segregation. They've received a lot of promises that were unfulfilled. They are continuing to strike. Um, and right before King goes down there, the courts pass a law. The law says you cannot strike or picket in this town. That's the law. Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, James Shuttleworth decide we're going to proceed anyway and make an announcement. They don't sort of just proceed anyway. They say, we are going to defy this law and we are going to proceed. And they broke the law. They were summarily addressed, arrested. While they're arrested, white clergy in Birmingham write a letter in the newspaper. It's important for the, to understand the words because you're going to, I hope you all go home and read this. This is important. And when they were in the, in prison, in jail, they weren't in prison, in jail, white clergy write a letter and denouncing the tactics and law breaking that these clerk that King did, you guys broke the law. You're not even from here. Just be patient. We'll get there. King writes 18 pages. You got time. You're in jail. <laughs> but it's some of the most important 18 pages that have ever been written in this country. Please read it. But as you think about what are the laws, rules, policies that you are shaped by, which are the ones you stand up to and which are the ones you go along with? Because they're not all good and not all bad and probably none of them are either. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly legitimate concern. Since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954 outlawing segregation in public schools, at first glance, it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously break laws. One may ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws. There are just and unjust laws. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey. You have a moral re responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And then starts to cite philosophers, as he's wont to do in this letter. Now, what makes the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. In healthcare, that means something that honors our shared humanity, that which you are here to cure. Maybe. You can think about it for, for yourself. 
An unjust code is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. An unjust law is a law, a human law that is rooted in internal natural order, natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just, a law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. He's referencing something earlier in the letter, read it. More concrete example, an unjust law is a code that is numerical or power majority group compels a minority group to obey but does not make binding on itself. This is a difference made legal, a difference made legal. By the same token, a just code, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow and that it is willing to follow itself. This is sameness made legal. Another explanation, a law is unjust if it is inflicted on a minority that as a result of being denied the right to vote had no part in acting or devising the law et cetera, et cetera. When you see workarounds for wealthy folks, it might be a sign of something unjust going on, right? You compel it on some, but not others. Right? So I know the way to get a workaround because we do these workarounds all the time when VIP care happens. VIP care is like a sentinel. Ooh, maybe something unjust is going on. We've figured out how to create laws that are compelled for some, but not others. That's not the same, not, not sameness made legal. Right? So one of the other things that I think is important to describe here, and this is in another part that I'm not quoting, is King makes it really clear that when you do stand up, it's important to do so loudly. It's not enough to simply do a workaround. He announced, I am coming to break this unjust law. Right, bringing it to the surface, making clear what you're standing for and why, and being willing to suffer the consequences, right? He went to jail, he got out of jail, and we're still reading him because he stood on something much deeper than, um, uh, his own person, like he was connecting to something that has uh, roots in something that much more common to our humanity than simply the moment. But there are times in our lives where we'll see this every day where, hey, the reason I'm doing this work around, I don't like this work around, we should talk about this, right? I'm doing it here today, we're talking about it. Like these are the ways in which you can make clear how these unjust laws ought to be defied when and how, and do so proudly which is what he did. Does anybody have any examples of just or unjust medical context? I only have 10 more minutes, so I wanna make sure I use them. For you to talk to me, I'm here to learn too. Yeah. I mean, at the time, folks were, this was pre-voting rights bill, right? They were actively keeping people from voting. Segregation was not covert. It was the law. It wasn't just, I mean, it was, you can't come here. You can go around the back door, right? So these weren't sort of as nuanced as, but there are a lot of things that are today not particularly nuanced that you will find. And I encourage you to think about them. Like, I don't want to be like, when you see these things, I want you to start to look and recognize 
that this is less about heroes and villains and more about individuals against systems. What are those systems? Because I think it's very easy to say, well, once we get rid of this person or once I become in charge, well, you're not gonna change it, right? These are, unless you're willing to change the system. And one of the challenges, these systems protect themselves against people who might rise to power and change them. So we need to think about that from any place where you might be, you also have influence. Okay, let me quickly move to three things you can do today. Like one of the things I promised is that I'm gonna give you some solutions. And so I'm gonna give you a couple and I'm gonna leave you with the poem up and then we can talk about it if we have time. Okay. One of the things that we can do today is we need a new type of leader who is not waiting for a formal role. That can be any of you. Who are willing to recognize and touch systems, not simply go along with them. Sometimes you need to go along with them. There are just laws. And sometimes you need to not go along with them. There are unjust laws. And being willing to discern and articulate the difference and do so present. Like, look, we are currently in the midst of transformations that are changing life expectancy, curing diseases that didn't exist. Cancer is curable, not just treatable, curable in ways that did not exist when I was first standing here. Blindness is being eradicated. We have genetic viral cures, all kinds of amazing things that are happening, but these will accelerate inequity unless we turn our gaze away from market-based consumption and towards human beings, right? Because if it costs you a million and a half to cure your cancer, who's getting their cancer cured? It's gonna be clear. And to build a future that doesn't resemble the past, like a different future, not the same one over, it means it's not enough to just simply know the history or the policies produced by these sort of merciless systems, but we need a generation of leaders who have like the creativity, clarity, and courage to choose a new direction. And to be clear, that has to like kind of be practiced. Like it's not gonna start like, well, I'll start once I graduate. Well, once I'm in my attending role, then I'll start. Well, wait, not, not when I'm junior attending. I'll wait when I'm senior attending. Because wait, you guys watch Discovery Channel and you see like the giraffes born on the Serengeti? And they've got like those spindly wobbly legs. And then they can run. And then they're tall. Like it's the same with moral leadership, right? You got to practice. You got to start now and have your spindly wobbly legs. And then continue to practice so that as you mature in your career, so does your adroitness with moral leadership. Like you can't just sort of wait till one day when it's like, now I'm safe. Now it's time. The other thing is you have to build things that don't exist. Again, we want a future that's not the same as the past. We want a better future. You have to build things that don't exist, right? So let's pretend like we waved a magic wand and society was no longer segregated. We had health insurance for everyone. We would still need a lot of things that don't exist. We would need provider capacity. We don't have enough to care for everybody today. We would need tools to help people with mental illness, chronic illness, substance abuse disorder that we don't have. We would need to knit together a fragmented healthcare system with people, technology, and systems that do not exist. And we would need to encourage our non-healthcare organizations to participate, given that our bodies are shaped by things that happen outside of here. All these things are new, right? And we need people who will build those that are building them towards a shared humanity and not simply to try to maximize something that doesn't maximize our shared humanity, right? The sorts of leaders who are recognized that we have this shared experience that is more important than profit, for example. And in, in quiet moments, we all know that our bodies are more important than profit because how much is your vision worth? If I gave you $20 million, would you go blind? Like nobody would take that, right? So we know that these things are more important, but then we have to breathe life into our systems in the same way. And then the last thing is that of these systems that we had one of our guests point out, we already have things that work, quality improvement, for example. Um, 
we know in our emergency department, our door to balloon times, our left without being seen times, our wait times, our use of physical restraints, we can turn those same tools to maximize our shared humanity and create equity. So long as we're collecting and using the data effectively and we're willing to stare at uncomfortable truths, even when we're complicit, like, man, I'm a part of this and allow for those stress positions to be your opportunity to transcend. Like who can stay in these stress positions long enough kind of defines who succeeds. Medical school is one of those perfect examples. Like it's a stress position for four years. You just have to sit in that. And if you use these same tools to turn them towards a society that we want to see, not the one we have, it allows for us to be the sorts of leaders and advocates towards these bigger questions that we care about. I'm done, but I wanna put this up. Do you all know Audre Lord? Yeah, see, I'm telling you guys a lot of stuff you already know. But I think this is an important poem, right? She's just a technical master of expression and poetry is sort of like one of the most efficient writing forms. Strips away a whole lot of BS and gets you like, what is it you're trying to say? And how do you do it concisely? Like this is a, bo a book's worth of meaning. She's a New Yorker. She was the children of immigrants, poet, professor. And this poem is a litany for survival that came in 1978, which is actually the same year she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She was 44. And that breast cancer ultimately claimed her life in her late 50s. And when the sun rises, we are afraid. We're afraid it might not remain. And when the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we're afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcome. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it's better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. It's a woman speaking about being in that vanguard of people who see it and are willing to speak about it. it, it it's linked to the to the invitation. So I, I encourage you to sort of read this and her work. But like the King letter, read that. Um, and with that, I'll end and open questions if you all have any.